you know, my advice to people who are in leadership, know that it, it's everything you do matters. Hmm. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, I didn't sign up for all that. <laughs> I go, yeah, well, you didn't have a choice because that's sort of what the job always has been, whether it was written that way or not. This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 218. What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host. I hope you're doing well. In today's episode, you'll hear my interview with Audrey Russo. If you're unfamiliar with Audrey, she is the president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, which is the oldest and largest technology trade association in North America. She's previously worked for large multinational Fortune 500 companies, as well as Maya Design. And she also co-hosts Tech Vibe Radio on KDKA 1020 AM, Friday nights at 7, where she explores technology, companies, and entrepreneurial issues. Uh, in the interview, you'll hear us talk about executive leadership, how to effectively work with boards, how to make an impact in the world as a leader and so much more. There's a ton of wisdom in this. Uh, I know that you're going to absolutely love it. But before we dive into the interview with Audrey, just a few announcements. I want to let you know we are hosting our first annual L3 One Day Leadership Conference on Friday, March 15th, 2019 at the Marriott in Cranberry Township, just 20 minutes outside of the city of Pittsburgh. Our keynote speakers include Matt Keller, who is a pastor in Next Level Church in Fort Myers, Florida, Dr. Chris Howard, who is the president of Robert Morris University, Salim Gabril, the executive director of the Pittsburgh Promise, Kim Fleming, the CEO of Hefford Tillotson, and many other speakers that will be on panels and breakout sessions. Uh, it's going to be an incredible day. I hope that you'll join us, and I hope that you'll bring your team, invest in their leadership. Um, you can learn more about the conference and register for it at L31day.com. Again, that's L31day.com. I hope to see you there. I also want to thank our sponsor, Alex Dulandon. Alex is a full-time realtor with Keller Williams Realty. And if you are looking to buy or sell a house in the Pittsburgh market, Alex is your guy. He's a member and a supporter of L3 Leadership, and he would love to have an opportunity to connect with you. You can learn more at pittsburghpropertyshowcase.com. With that being said, enjoy the interview, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. Uh, hey, Audrey, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. And why don't we just start off with you just giving us a brief overview of who you are and what you do. Oh, my gosh, a brief overview. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm Audrey Rousseau. I'm president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Tech Council. And also uh, we have a nonprofit called 40 by 80. And uh, I've been at the Tech Council, which is like 11 years, sort of crazy. Wow. Um, every time I think I'm going to leave, something great happens. And uh, I get reengaged and reinvigorated. So um, I started my career off in many different ways, um, thought I would be a social worker for a little while and then realized I was too much of a capitalist and <laughs> very much interested in systems and technology, um, and then got into tech, uh, worked for a company called Reynolds Metals, and that was just fabulous. It was in a time where, you know, the tech people were working in Visual Basic and uh working in big server rooms. We were very proud of our big um, mainframe computers and uh, the days of AS400s, and we thought we were all innovative, talking <laughs> about laying T1 lines and et cetera. So totally loved that, really loved systems, and, and um, that's really been my theme, if I could say, around the course of my career, is sort of understanding the macro view of how pieces fit together. As my mother used to say, I was, like, born doing puzzles. Hmm. And uh, so it's sort of that's been the analogy for the work that I've done. So came to Pittsburgh in 2001 with Alcoa. They acquired the company that I work for, and I ran a global ERP for Alcoa. So, and then I worked for my design, and then they found me across the river from where I was, and uh, I got recruited for this job that I've been in. Wow. Well, Audrey, I want to talk to you a little bit about your leadership journey. Uh, when I listened to a podcast about your story, it sounded right. like leadership was something that you inherited very early on, 22 years old, right. overseeing 115 people. Uh, can you just talk about what do you wish people knew about your leadership journey that they may not know? Well, first of all, um, you know, when I look back at that, I, in many ways, I'm a little bit amazed. Uh, I also realized that I've always been a person that's grabbed onto more. I've always wanted to do more than what I'm doing at the current moment. 
And that can be not a great thing growing <laughs> up, right? I mean, if you're a parent or you have friends, you know that. That can be a little bit of an annoying characteristic. But I learned, I had these amazing internships when I was an undergrad. I probably have like eight internships maybe in undergrad because I'm such an applied person. I'm really not, I'm a voracious reader, but I'm much more of an applied kinesthetic learner. Hmm. And so I have to feel and touch things and experience things. So I've always been one to raise my hand to do things. And um, I think that's what happened early on. Early on, there was an opportunity. I wrote some paper in undergrad, and there was an opportunity for me to explore how in, having to help um, an, an institution get deinstitutionalized. Mm -hmm. And that's when I had 115 people work for me. And it was at the time when people who had mental health and developmental disabilities were erroneously placed in institutions, and there was a load of class action suits across the United States that were forcing people to um, think differently about putting people in institutions mm -hmm. and they should go back into their communities. And for whatever reason, I worked for someone who said, you know what, I think you could really help sort of lead us through this. And I said, of course I can. <laughs> of course I can. Um, I never, I, I don't think I've ever suffered much from lack of confidence. Some people will call it bossiness. I say it's just an accumulation of experience. Sure. It's just made me confident. Um, I think being an only, oldest child, I think that my father was an entrepreneur, firstborn American. Same thing with my mother. I think there's some feistiness and grit that I allowed myself to adopt. And I come from a big family with lots of cousins and lots of aunts and uncles and grandparents who all were first born, if mm. not born in other countries. And I do think there's this kind of passion that and determination that came from that. Our generation, my generation of cousins were the first ones that went to college, you know, the first ones to sort of lift themselves up out of that world. So I think it's a combination of things. Do I think that you're born with it? I think that there are some people who obviously are introverted but can be leaders. I think there are people who are extroverted that cannot be leaders. I think you have to find out what do you get your juice from being around other people and understanding that their greatness is part of what you deliver hmm. into the world. And I think I had that. I found that sort of early on. And I like being able to problem solve. I like being able to work on puzzles. I like being able, you know, I'm a competitive Scrabble player. I like playing <laughs> chess. I like doing all those kinds of things. And I think putting, you know, that all together, um, I, I made sure that I don't care if I'm a woman, you know, I don't care if I, you know, I'm young. I don't care. I mm. want it. I deserve it. I also think it's about okay. having great interpersonal skills. Now, there are people who know me that think I don't have great interpersonal skills. They think I'm too bossy. They might think I'm not collaborative enough. Um, but I love people. You know, I really love being able to work with people. And my biggest love is essentially developing other people. Hmm. So I'm curious on the development part. I love that. What have you found to be the best ways to develop people? I, I read an article that said uh, you're fantastic at pushing people far beyond their comfort zones. Right. So how, how do you do that? How do you develop I leaders? do do that. That is what, you know, one of my biggest um, issues is, is that very often I have bigger dreams for people than they have for themselves. Hmm. You know, I'll see the diamond in someone and they'll go, whoa, I don't, I don't know if I really want to do that. But if you talk with people who've worked with me, over a long period of time, they will tell you that I push them out of their comfort zones and sort of demand that. Because I know that if you're too comfortable, you're really being mediocre to yourself mm -hmm. and to the organization and to the world, your place in the world. But again, not everyone fits, fits that mold, right? Not everyone's going to gravitate towards that. Uh, the other thing that I've sort of learned, and this is sort of cliche, but I really am very intentional about it. I love surrounding myself with people who are strong, people who have high intellectual aptitude, and people who won't just say yes to me. Because my personality is, and my leadership style is such that I need 
Most people need that, yeah. but I actually need it because I'm an outside thinker. So I've got to be able to talk out loud with people to understand their perspective to see if what I'm going for is really the right journey. Now, sometimes I don't listen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm just so emphatic and I absolutely do not listen. Yeah. And there are people who will say to me, she's absolutely stubborn and she will get laser focused and she will not listen. And I've made mistakes along the way. Sure. I totally, I mean, I'm a mortal as much as I wish I wasn't. <laughs> I'm a mere mortal. So, you know, I like to have fun. I think I have a great sense of humor. Um, I love to talk in front of people. And I learned that as, as a young age. That's another thing. When I was very young, I learned that it was really important to learn how to, how to speak in front of crowds and how to work an audience and how to carve a story to make a point. And I, and I learned that. And I sort of look at any time that I'm speaking, what's the shape of that story? What's the beginning? What's the middle? What's the end? And what are the points that I want to get across? And I really honed on that. Yeah, I want to go back just for a second on the, the surrounding yourself with people who will tell you no, that are stronger yeah. than you. What are some things you do intentionally there? Because with strong personalities, I know it's right. easy to be surrounded with people with nothing to say. So right. what do you do intentionally to make sure that's happening in your life? Well, what I do is, what do you think? Do you think that I'm... Um, I'm right. What are your ideas? Why are you not talking to me hmm. about certain things? What is it? Why do you think that I know all the answers? So I facilitate that kind of, of conversation. And the other thing is, is sometimes we can be strong and loud. Um, and I have to be sensitive to that because the last thing I want to do is create an uncomfortable work environment. But there are people who will work with me and we'll go back and forth. I'll just say no, and we'll say, and that person will say yes, and I'll say why? Nope, don't agree with you. I thought I asked you to do that, and it will get a little intentionally heated. But I want people to feel comfortable with that, you know, and yeah. and because the world isn't all so nicey nice. And I think if you can get in touch with who you are as a leader and and as a contributor, because we're all leaders. In my organization, we're all leaders. They're the face of working with, with our members. They're the face of having conversations on subject matter content. So it's really important for them to understand what it means to sort of lead people through thought, through engagement, through, through outcome. But you can't be a shrinking violet and sort of work with me. That is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, I'm curious... Um... A lot of people look at the perks of leadership, or at least the perceived perks of leadership. Can you talk about the price of leadership and the responsibility that comes with it? Uh, I think a lot of times young leaders especially right. are, are kind of drawn to it for the wrong reasons. Right. What's the price that comes with it's, being in your Listen, seat? it's lonely, and you're under a microscope. You're really under a microscope. There are times where I have not realized what I've said to someone, and it could be like three words that I've said to someone, that so erroneously resonated with that person in a negative way. Hmm. And I didn't even mean anything by it, right? So the, it's, it's just so fascinating about how you're under the microscope hmm. from what you wear, from what you talk, who you talk to, who you spend time to, what you spend your time on, and making really, really hard decisions about people. And people in their lives, whether you, you're promoting them, whether you're firing them, whether you're hiring them, there's a lot of times you have no one to talk to. No one. You know, yes, if you have a partner, you can confide in certain situations and, you know, hopefully you have someone that, that can be sort of supportive and listening and inquisitive and give you some perspective. But it's lonely, you got to stand out there and be counted. I like to be responsible. Hmm. I like to be responsible for things. I like to be responsible for others. I like to be responsible for seeing other people thrive. But it's not that pretty. 
You know, there and in my role now, this role, there are many times that people will call, whether it's the press, whether it's local press, whether it's national press, asking about some cantankerous issue, whether it's public policy, et cetera. And the news is fascinating because they don't take everything that you've said. You know, there have been so many times where I have been misquoted Mm -hmm. or misrepresented, particularly in this day and age which is one of the things I love about doing radio and love about these podcasts, like the one that we're doing now, because yeah. I can have like an authentic conversation that no one's going to like cut off or bifurcate and say, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've said, oh, you know, I really love that, right? And the it will sound like in an article, like I'm some flaky dingbat that just says, oh, she loves that. Huh. You know, so I've had to be, like, so intentional. And how do you deal with that when that happens? I'm just curious. Internally and just... Oh, well, everyone here will tell you that I'll rant. <laughs> I'll just say, you know, words and I'll rant and be irked. But the lesson is, the lesson is I have to learn to be more intentional now, the way the news is today. The way the news is today is not how the news was 20 years ago. That's it's fact. so totally different and that's great and i'm you know i'm always an early adopter i'm always one fascinated with changes i'm a big user of social media um but i am fascinated with how big long deep thoughts can get totally hijacked into one small sentence so, so what advice you talked about being under the magnifying glass as a leader, everything you do gets magnified. What advice do you have for leaders to represent themselves well and their organizations in, in the world that we live right. in today? It's complicated. Yeah. I think look, what I say is, is that you have a serious responsibility. You really do. Whether you're running a startup that only has two or three people or one that has, you know, a hundred to someone who's running a, a small nonprofit, you know, that You have a responsibility that your whole person, your whole person is a reflection of your work Hmm. and vice versa, that your whole life is a reflection. So meaning, how do you contribute in the community? Are you out partying on the weekends? And what does that mean? Right. You know, do you do you overindulge and do other people see that? And can they judge you by that? Um, Do you do things that perhaps you don't want everyone to know about, which is okay, but just realize that that's your responsibility now. You have the same kind of visual, um, visual awareness to the world that the CEO of General Electric might have had. Hmm. There's no, you know, the entree into your life is the same. They probably are more protected now because they know how to, you know, sort of manage their way through it. You and I are just still bumbling through it. And you have a responsibility, you have a responsibility, so it changes your your life. The other thing is you also have to look at why, what do your relationships look like? How do you, how are are people in a relationship for you, for you? Hmm. Are they in a relationship for you because of the power that you wield? Are they in a relationship with you because they want something from you? Are they in a relationship with you because it looks good to them to be affiliated with you? You know, I've had to sort that out a wow. lot. And then to develop relationships in a business perspective. and to ha- I mean, because I do have a lot of friends, right? I do have a lot of friends. But then to understand the nuances of that relationship when it comes to it's just business hmm. to really having some friendship. And then knowing that at the end of whatever cycle you're in, those relationships could dissipate. You can't burn bridges. I've burned bridges in my life. I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a mere mortal. I have burned bridges. I have a strong personality. I have a strong vision. Um, I'm not, I'm someone who's cynical about Pittsburgh nice. That whole thing of this over, everyone's Pittsburgh's nice. <laughs> um, because I think that yields mediocrity. Hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to be nasty. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rising tides, rising tides. So, you know, my advice to people who are in leadership, know that it, it's everything you do matters. Hmm. 
You know, you got to have great financial acumen. You got to have a lot of transparency. You've, it's, it's spending time with people, not just doing stuff for an organization or a company. Coalescing people so that they can do things on their own and drive tremendous outcomes. I mean, it's, it's almost like sometimes I hear people say, well, I didn't sign up for all that. <laughs> I go, yeah, well, you didn't have a choice because that's sort of what the job always has been, whether it was written that way or not. Yeah. So so with that on the responsibility side, so one, as an executive leader, you, it's not like you don't report to anyone, right? You report to a board. Yeah, I have a uh, great board. But you've also sat on many boards. So I'm just yeah. curious on that relationship. And I guess for anyone listening to this, it could be the supervisor you report to. But how do you interact with your board as an executive leader? Mm -hmm. To, to get them what they want and make sure that they're pleased with the results of your organization. And then I want to hear the opposite end of, as a board member, what are you looking for? Right. Maybe, maybe it's the same answer. But. Well, no, it's interesting. That's a great question. First of all, I've been very, the hardest part of my role, believe it or not, has been with my board. Not because they're hard people, but they're an amazing group of people. I have an amazing group of people who have led startups or who have been at the helm of corporate America. So they have this cartoon in their head, right? They have this cartoon in their head about what the tech council is, how it fits into their, you know, personal lives and their agenda, as well as what does the tech council mean in terms of its impact to the community, because I have deep passion for it, right? Some of the people on the board don't have that deep passion. Many people do because of the way that we've recently reconfigured the board and, you know, tried to give it some new life. But they are not an operational board. They're an advisory board, and they have some fiduciary responsibilities. But other than that, they're not involved in the operations day to day. So it's very interesting. When I first came, I had 38 people on the board. Oh, my gosh. We can have 42. <laughs> and slowly over time... You know, we've kept some of these older, you know, people who have been on the board for a long time who give it legacy and understand the purpose and have love for the work as well as bring in new people. And it's so fascinating because everyone has a different perspective. Every one of them is a leader in some way of some huge company or they flipped three companies and made a ton of money, or they're, you know, they've been in the ecosystem for a long time, and they've seen their companies come up, so every single one of them has a different view. So I have to learn, I've had to learn, what are their individual selfish interests? What motivates them to be a part of this? What's the win for them? And so I've had to spend years mm -hmm. spending time with different board members, understanding what their um, passions are, what are their priorities, and being open to them telling me what I'm doing wrong and where they've been disappointed. So the other piece of being a leader is hearing all that other feedback, right? So you get this right. feedback from the community, from the ink, from, you know, social media, then from your board. So you constantly, you know, and if you're thin skin and you're fragile, it's hard to be a leader because you just become defensive. And then on top of that, you're pretty lonely to begin with. So you can easily get in defensive mode. I like to lean into relationships. So I like to find out what motivates people and what does a win look like for them. I that's, love that. That's sort of how I operate. Sometimes it's exhausting. You know, I'm sometimes out almost every night of the week. And sometimes by a Friday night, I just want to curl up with my dog and not talk to another human. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just because I do need some sort of, you know, I've been yep. pistol whipped for, the, you know, for the, like the whole week. But I have a huge sense of pride in, you know, trying to be a leader that has operational expertise, financial expertise, be a leader. But I also ha occasionally will have people say to me on my team, like, hey, you're slipping a little bit. Hmm. Here's what we expect out of you, and you're slipping. And sometimes I, I like go, that makes me feel bad. But thank you. Yeah. So if anyone thinks being a leader is all sexy, <laughs> it can be. It certainly can be. 
But it's not all that can be easily articulated in a little book that says, here's the how-tos. Yeah. I am curious. You talked about <clears throat> when you become a leader, you don't just do stuff for the organization anymore. You actually have to spend time with people and help people. Uh, in your position, what is the greatest uh, investment of your time and resources on a daily basis, and how do you even determine that? Sometimes I can't determine that, right? Sometimes it's, like, awfully crazy. Um, my best investment of time is when I'm sitting working with someone who's stuck on a problem. Love it. And that's my best investment. It really is. And then, and then for them to come up with a way to solve it and own it. Because there's another trick here that people tend to do. They tend to manage up. <laughs> Meaning, I don't know what to do with this, Audrey. You do it. You, you, know, you help me do it. And it's really easy and very seductive to go, whoop, solve that problem, whoop, solve that problem. But that's a flaw. The flaw is to help them have the tools so that they can solve that problem and they're feeling empowered, not to, to push it up. Yeah, so I'm curious, how do you deal with difficult people or people that, that may ultimately have to be let go? I'm just curious. I do that a lot. I've had that a lot in my life. Yes. I mean, I've just done it so many times. So are you? is it a real quick process it for depends. you? Or do you give people it grace? Yeah. It really, really depends. If there are egregious things that happen that violate the law, that, that are morally reprehensible that are discriminatory, it's instantly. If it's someone who has been on a journey for a while, and, you know, we all have life issues, right? My mother just died. My, mm, I, you know, I'm, so sorry. I'm just like, I'm not myself, right? Yeah. You know, I'm not, it's sort of fresh, I'm fresh off of that. I'm not necessarily in my game. Well, but I've been in my game for a long time, right? So no one's going to be on me just because I'm, you know, have a few weeks of not being in my game. So the variables are so different. Um, you got to know your people, though. You got to know, like, okay, hey, you just had a baby. <laughs> You're up all night. Uh, yeah, what can I do to help you? How can I accommodate you? One thing about working at the Tech Council, we give a lot of accommodations. Hmm. We really work with people to figure out how to accommodate them. It, even if it means letting them come in because there's traffic coming out, and letting them come in later or, you know, cause our people work all different kinds of crazy hours. If it means that um, we give amazing benefits, we close down during Christmas, you know, and they don't have to use their own paid time off for, you know, like 14 days, wow. 13 days. Um, we make sure that they're, everyone's competitively paid. We give them the best health insurance. That if someone's listening to this, are you hiring? I am. I'm actually, <laughs> looking, I have one job that is open. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a position that reports to me. So, yes, look on our website. <laughs> um, yeah. But, I mean, we work hard, and it's not a place where you come where people are just sitting around shooting the shit. You know, our win here is when when one of our members and, and their companies win. Yeah, That's what we celebrate, and that's what we're measured by. We set up that process so that we're measured by that. So you have to, in order to work here, you have to love that. And if you don't love that, it's not a good fit. So I've made a ton of difficult decisions. You know, I've had to fire people. I've had horror stories of um, horrible things happening with with employees in my work environment um when my like almost 28 years ago when i was pregnant with my daughter someone worked for me and um murdered his wife Jeez. you know i mean i had an employee that was killed in the office um i've had you know i mean i could tell you some crazy things of domestic violence mm -hmm. of you know, it's like I didn't sign up for yeah. that, but you, but that's what you're you're dealing with humans. So you deal with, yeah. And the more humans you deal with, and the more you look, understand what national statistics are. You know, domestic violence does happen at work. So I've been, I've learned. I've really been in the line of fire in terms of working with people, and and that's just because if you look at numbers, it's just how long I've been doing it. Right, the likelihood is that I'm going to run into that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I want to touch on this before we jump into what I call the lightning round, but you talked about national statistics, and I love when you shared the beginning of your story that you started off your career wanting to go into to social work, wanting to make a difference one person at a time, right. which so many people have that heart, or at least when they start out because they want to make right. an impact in the world, want to change right. the world. But you flipped that model, or at least how you viewed it, and it's changed everything for you. Right. And so can you talk to leaders, one, about how you view making a difference in the world for you mm-hmm. and a change in systems? I think that's fascinating. And maybe your advice for leaders in making the impact they right. want to make. Listen, there are people who like to make an impact one person at a time. And thank goodness that we have people that are there doing that kind of work. That work is not for me. I like working on things that are bigger than me. And that's probably one of the reasons why I love the job at the Tech Council, because I feel like I'm working on something that's so large and so important. And looking at the kind of growth and buildup that happens in our quote-unquote ecosystem takes a momentous amount of effort that you have to influence, you have to drive, you have to partner You have to watch fail sometimes, you know, you have to advocate for, you have to puff up, you have to tear down. So I like those bigger kinds of things. I'm not the person who wants to just help one person at a time. How I help one person at a time is through the people that work for me and with me. And that's, I've come to learn that. Did you deal with guilt or shame around that when you first started? Or was that an easy transition for you to make? No, it clicked for me when I was in graduate school. It all of a sudden clicked for me when I was in a systems class, an operational class. And it it really clicked for me. I said, yes, Hmm. I like moving that big stuff around because I feel like I'm part of something larger than myself. And it seems more sustainable. And it seems less emotional when you're working one-on-one and trying to help people it's very emotional i'm an emotional enough person in terms of my passion that for me to feel like i've failed in trying to help one person Hmm. just did not align for me so it was one of those things that went off in my head pretty quickly i'm highly introspective and i'm highly hard on my myself Okay, you can hear it. I'm similar, yeah. You can hear it, right? You can hear it. I'm my worst critic. And um, I'm not afraid of feedback. I'm not, you know? There are people who detest me. And for whatever reason, I don't know what to say. No one will ever say she's not looking out for the good of this region, though. Hmm. No one will ever say she doesn't care about the kinds of things that matter. And remember, I, you got to love my board for picking a woman who was a dark horse in a male organization that was started by a whole bunch of men. Hmm. And they believed in me. And they worked with me as we took the organization apart. We had all this turnaround to do the first three years that I was here. And they supported me. And I loved them for that. And they were all men except for one. And she's Marley Myers, who was the founder of Morgan Lewis and Bacchus um, office here in Pittsburgh. But the rest of them were all men, all white men. And they were great. And they welcomed me. And they respected my journey, my professional journey. And I was blown away by that. Hmm. So my hat's off to them, really. Because a lot of people wouldn't want to work with me. They would think, oh, why would we want to take on that kind of you know, drive and passion. Yeah. Well, it certainly benefited the organization. You have a great track record and have made a great difference. Yeah. So, but good, good for them. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. So when people say, what about, you know, white guys and what about men and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I've had a pretty good bunch of people that have been around me. It doesn't mean that I'm not advocating for more diversity and more appropriate representation. As we, we start to wrap up just for time's sake, um, I'll just leave this really open ended. Uh, Anything you want to leave leaders with today? Well, you know, I, I've talked about, um, we've talked about leadership. I could talk about that forever, right? Um, and I hope that I've given the listeners a good perspective on, on where I see things. You know, I have a lot of energy. Um, I've been gifted with that, or I have ADHD, whatever it may be. <laughs> I have a lot of energy. 
I'm on a lot of boards. That's another thing I would advise people. I always have been civic-minded since I was 15, 16. I've always been civic-minded. I've always been taught that you have to give. You have to give back. So I sit on a lot of boards. I've always sat on a lot of boards. And those have cultivated some of the most fabulous relationships. One of the ways that I actually um, got to work at Maya was when I was at Alcoa sitting on the board of Cora. Hmm. And the founder of Maya was on the board. I mean, so you just don't know what kinds of relationships get cultivated, not just in the work of the board, but those other people who are on the board. It's expanding. Just like when I, my people, when I came into this job, I had a global work experience, global. I came to this job, I was like, people didn't have passports. I was like, whoa, 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 we've got to (laughs) change this. All of you. You need to be seeing the world. I'm going to put you, and all those people who work directly for me have global development plans. Yeah, well, thank you so much for everything you do for our city, for our region. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thanks for taking an hour to invest in myself. Thank you for caring. Thank you for caring and doing this work. It's really important. It's an honor. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to our interview with Audrey. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can find key takeaways and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 218. I want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. My wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers, and we just think they're an incredible company. Not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in people. In fact, they give every engaged couple a book to help them prepare for their marriage, and we just love that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. You can also stay up to date with everything we're doing here at L3 Leadership by signing up for our email list. When you sign up, you'll get a free copy of my ebook, Making the Most of Mentoring, which is my step-by-step process for getting and cultivating relationships with mentors. Uh, I think it'll add massive value to your life, so make sure you sign up for that on our website. And uh, as always, I like to end with a quote, and I will quote Mark Cole, who's the CEO of all of John Maxwell's company companies, and he said this. He said, success is what you can do on your own significance is what you do for others. I love that. Success is what you can do on your own, but significance is what you do for others. Thanks so much for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. Laura and I appreciate you so much, and we will talk to you next episode. <laughs>